The ancient wisdom that there's a sucker born every minute has been especially pertinent given the financial disasters of the past few years. So it's time for a short and painless test. Are you sometimes just too trusting? Do you invest in things you don't really understand? Are you also a bit greedy? Then you too could be suffering from pigeon fever. Pigeons, just so you know, are what con men call their victims. After a year of revelations about Bernard Madoff, who cheated investors out of billions, you might think Americans have wised up. Fat chance. Prosecutors and regulators tell us that even in this age of skepticism, Ponzi schemes like Madoff's are thriving. One regulator even calls it Ponzimonium. As a student of con games and deception, were you at all surprised by the Bernie Madoff scam? And would you be surprised if I told you that I predicted it? For starters, we approached Ricky Jay, America's foremost card sharp, actor, sleight of hand artist, a man with an encyclopedic knowledge of con men past and present. He told us of a talk he gave seven years before Madoff's fall, a lecture on financial fraud to a gathering of police officers in 2001. I would also be aware of someone who will rely heavily on an affiliation with an investor group, be it religious, ethnic, or geographic. He was describing Madoff to a T. I think these elements will make the market ripe for any sort of pyramid or Ponzi scam, Ricky Jack. And that is pure Bernard Madoff. It's pure Bernie Madoff. But can I tell you another element of the con? that I actually made this page on Photoshop last night and put it into this bullet. And I did that to prove a point. And the point you is... Had, you got me. Good. You set it up by saying that I was a student of cons and that I'm knowledgeable in that area, and so you allowed my supposed expertise to make you believe this is true. This magazine is true. I really have lectured to this group of police against confidence crime. Everything is true except for this page, which I slipped in last night. So what's, what's the moral? Trust no one. We wouldn't want to live in a world where we couldn't be conned because, in effect, we would then be living in a world where we mistrusted or refused to trust anyone. So this is the price we pay. And pay we have. In the wake of the Madoff scandal, Ponzi perp walks have become a marathon. Texas financier Alan Stanford accused of a $7 billion Ponzi scheme. Minnesota businessman Tom Petters convicted recently of a $3 billion scam. And Park Avenue lawyer Mark Dreyer, mastermind of a mere $400 million Ponzi scheme. Despite the downfall of the Dreyers and the Madoffs, Ponzi operators, large and small, are busier than ever, knowing we're all capable of greed, misplaced trust, and something else. I think it's anxiety. It's anxiety that you're losing out, that other people are doing better than you are. Stephen Greenspan is a University of Colorado professor who writes and lectures on gullibility, warning audiences that not reading the fine print or buying something on a tip from your brother-in-law are bad ideas, and that older people are particularly vulnerable to a friendly pitch from a con man. In most of the great moments of gullibility in history, the perpetrator seems to target a particular group, correct? Yes. There have been Mormon Ponzi schemes targeting Mormons or fundamentalist Christians. Uh, Madoff uh, mostly was aimed at Jews because he was a prominent Jewish philanthropist. So yes, there is this affiliation aspect of it because we tend to trust our own kind. Mr. Ponzi himself promised fellow Italian immigrants he could make them rich trading in postal reply coupons, sort of the prepaid phone cards of the day. Ponzi went to prison and died a pauper, but his name lives on for the fraud he made famous. Mr. Jay's library is replete with documents about cons, scams, and hoaxes of all kinds. Celebrated con men, including Count Victor Lustig. Uh, this is an original wanted poster of the Count. Uh, one of the things he did in France was that he was able to sell the Eiffel Tower for scrap metal. And he was able to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jay reports that over the years, people really have tried to sell the Brooklyn Bridge, as well as Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square in London. And in another cautionary tale, still unfolding, 
pigeons were both the investors and the investment. Arlen Galbraith, who called himself the Pigeon King, convinced hundreds of American and Canadian farmers there was good money to be made raising the birds for food. And everybody we talked to said this guy was, he was on the up and up. Nobody had a bad word to say about him anywhere that we could find. The Pigeon King assured investors that pigeons would replace chickens in every pot in America and the world. He'd sell you breeding stock and buy back the offspring. Soon, barns across the Midwest and Canada were filled to the rafters with birds and high hopes. But to some, including the Attorney General of Iowa, it sounded like a Ponzi scheme. Iowa and three other states barred the Pigeon King from doing business. And shortly after the Humberts bought in, Pigeon King International declared bankruptcy. The Humberts lost $300,000, most of it borrowed money. Galbraith declined our request for an interview. Canadian police now say he was running a Ponzi scheme. At least in Vegas, you know the odds always favor the house. Elsewhere, even the most sophisticated among us can be had. For instance, our gullibility expert Stephen Greenspan, who, after writing a book on the subject, discovered he lost $400,000 of his retirement money to who else? Bernie Madoff. And the fact was, Greenspan had never even heard of Madoff. The hedge fund managing his retirement money had simply reinvested the 400000 with Madoff. I don't even think I read the prospectus. <laughs> I trusted the people I was turning my money over to, and I've always done that, and it's usually worked well, except in this one case. What did your wife say to you when you confessed <laughs> that you'd lost part of your nest egg? I told you so, because <laughs> I tried to talk her into it. <laughs> and she said, I don't think so. <laughs> Which brings us to Wall Street and the financial meltdown of 2008. Poking through the wreckage, many experts believe the root cause was a perfect storm, a monsoon of gullibility colliding with a tidal wave of greed. This was a massive Ponzi scheme, and it's the biggest crime against the American economy in our lifetimes, in fact, ever. Janet Tavacoli is an analyst specializing in derivatives, the exotic financial instruments at the heart of the meltdown. She argues that the bad mortgage loans that fueled the crisis were repackaged by investment banks, sliced into increasingly complex derivatives, and resold to other investors, even though the underlying mortgages were often virtually worthless. You had various traders buying each other's products to artificially keep the prices up so that the bubble didn't collapse. Not only that, but the mortgage derivatives being traded were so mind-numbingly complicated, nobody understood them fully. Certainly not the pigeons, the buyers at banks, mutual funds, pension funds, and insurance companies who wound up holding a bag full of worthless paper. These guys are smart guys. They're all graduates of the finest business schools in the country, correct? Yes. If they were gullible, they're sophisticated investors. So they can't really go back to the investment banks that sold them this product and said, we've been had, because they held themselves out to be experts in these kinds of securities. All of which proves that whether you're on Wall Street or Main Street, brain power is no defense against con men. In fact, Smart guys may be the biggest suckers of all. As someone who does sleight of hand for a living, to me the ideal audience uh, would be scientists or Nobel Prize winners who are incredibly smart in their one area and often, often, not always, have an ego with them which says, I am really smart so I can't be fooled. No one is easier to fool. So Morley, I'm going to play you one hand of blackjack with certain propositions that make it too good to be true. The rules were all stacked in my favor. I got 20, he showed a nine, meaning I thought it was impossible for him to win. And God, the only thing that could beat you would be as if I had a 12 or something. <laughs> oh, which I do, you see, I have, I have the 12 of clubs. So I have 21 to your 20. But there's no such thing as a 12 of clubs, right? Wrong. Not only did Mr. J manipulate the cards somehow to get the ones he wanted, 
He was also dealing from a deck used in certain rummy games that includes 11s, 12s, and 13s. This pigeon had been had again. And the other real element of a con is that I told you this was too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Anyone should stand clear of something that's too good to be true. Because it never is. It never is.